All right, our final speaker is Brad Washa. He has served as the uh, Utah Bureau of Land Management State Fuel Specialist since 2004. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resource Management and Political Science from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. And he has a Master's of Science in Wildland Fire Science from Colorado State University. He began working in fire management in 1989, and he has experience over, on over 300 wildland fires. He's also served in a variety of fire and fuel management positions and details. And today he's going to be speaking about climate change and wildland fire. Thanks, Erica. I was wondering if the people in the front might want to move back, unless you don't mind getting wet. Um, <laughs> Just joking, it just seems kind of weird that everybody's in the back. Anyways, um, thanks for sticking around, um, and thanks for all my collaborators. There's 15 people that are here because we have a workshop tomorrow following this, um, this conference, so they're with the BLM that help out with our program within the state. So the reason why I'm here is I actually, this summer sometime, told Darren, why don't you have a presentation on, on the topic of... Uh, climate change and wildland fire. I was thinking he'd get someone academic wise and a researcher, not myself, but a month ago he said he had a, a, a vacancy and, and needed some help, so I somehow got volunteered into this. So a lot of times the closing speaker kind of sums up what happened in the last few days or you know, it gives you this energetic uh, hurrah type speech and go forth, do good. I'm not doing neither of those two. If, if I would have done that, I'd done something like yesterday, I realized I got about probably 30 years left on this earth, give or take a year or two, and that's probably a good thing because it's going to get hot and dry and start to suck. So um, I also realized I forgot to water my house plants, and they probably got air embolisms in them right now. So um, that, that's my summary. So um, about a month ago I was back in Wisconsin and I started thinking about, I had a free chance to think about putting this presentation together and was reading one of my parents, uh, their Lake Association um, book or pamphlet about um, you know, what's happening on Big Cedar Lake. And one of the things they had on there was the ice off dates. And I thought, wouldn't that be neat firewise if I could do a, a slide like that? And this, they've got really meticulous data and they have um, uh, basically a, a bet to see what day it comes off. If you win the bet, you get a, a free dinner at the local um, Timmers Resort. But uh, um, it's interesting, though. And if you look here, 19, uh, in the early 1950s, there was 100 days of ice on the lake from, uh, from December 31st to uh, you know, 100 days out. Um, but lately, it's dropped almost down to 90 days a year. And that actually doesn't account for the last two years. There wasn't ice on the lake until after the new year. So I thought maybe I could find some slide like that that would be cool fire-wise. I'm a little too fast with this. I also thought maybe an example like Portage Glacier up in Alaska. It's a really neat location uh, just at the tip of, um, at the northern tip of the Kenai Peninsula. Forest Service has a really nice visitor center they built in 1986. Um, this picture was taken about 15 years ago. You can't see the glacier anymore from that visitor center. Um, it's, the glacier's receded six, six uh, miles down the, the uh, Portage Lake. But, uh, so with that, um, how can we relate this to climate change and wildland fire? I want to look kind of at some things nationally, then look at it from a statewide basis, and then not necessarily do a tour of the fires I did this summer, but hit on a couple fires, wildland fires that I um, was involved with this summer um, within Utah. So if we look at wildland fire history, and, and there are some issues with this graph, but I think it makes some good points. One thing, unfortunately, it doesn't show 1910. That was a huge year. That was for you, Mike, for the Trump thing, huge. Um, that, that year was the big burn, and uh, over 3 million acres burnt within the uh, northern Rockies. Nationwide, about 5 million acres burnt at that time period. But a uh, uh, couple other anomalies that we should look at instead of just looking at this being a climate change element. In the 1930s, under the Depression, there were um, a large influx of manpower for the Forest Service. The Civilian Conservation Corps came to be, and uh, that helped as far as having a, instead of pulling people out of bars to fight fires, they actually had an organized workforce to be involved with that. Following World War II, we had, again, an impulse of uh, employment and personnel to work on fires. So that also helped along with mechanization and bringing in air resources. 
We then continued to have pretty good success with our suppression efforts um, until the early 1980s. And then we see a fairly major signif or a significant increase in fire activity. And these are millions of, of acres burnt in the western United States. It does not include Canada or Alaska. Um, if it would, that would really like two years ago, seven million acre, or five million acres burnt in Alaska. So it does not include Alaska, but we do definitely see an increase in part because of climate change, in part because successful suppression efforts in this time period, and uh, a number of droughts that occurred during this time period. You can also look at this sort of data for Utah specifically. This only goes back to 1970 on the x-axis. But these are fires over 1,000 acres or larger within Utah. And again, seeing an increase, this uh, yellow line here is the spring average temperature. And we see an increase in that. Um, and then the blue dotted line here is the snowpack water equivalency on the 1st of April. So we've already seen this, this slide. Um, this is basically data for Utah out of Salt Lake going back to 1895, looking at the mean annual temperature. And we can see basically within Utah, that temperature has gone from 46 degrees Fahrenheit to nearly 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit. If we look at the summer mean temperature, a little more variability, but again, an increase. What does that mean for fire? Well. Drier conditions in the summertime, hotter, drier conditions, larger fires. Um, also looking at uh, the spring data, again, not as much variability. Why is that important from a fire standpoint? Again, there's been discussion as far as um, snow melt. Um, this was actually a bunch of researchers. Some of you might be in here still. Um, they went out to the uh, West Desert, uh, the part of the Sage Stuff project. Um, every other vehicle was stuck. We, we got out of there pretty quick. We figured they could figure their way out of there. But as far as spring conditions, uh, wet roads, but also as far as the cheatgrass issue, kind of following up to the last presentation, you know, bringing on cheatgrass earlier, out competing some of those native vegetation. Also, spring concern, and from the higher elevation, is the snowpack. Um, a couple years ago, I was at a presentation, Chuck McHugh from the uh, Fire Center in uh, Missoula, the research station there, was looking at ERCs and looking at four stations around the greater Yellowstone area. Um, the, the talk that he was at was the 20 year reunion of the uh, 88 fires in Yellowstone. But basically looking at energy release components, an energy release component is the heat per unit area along the flaming front measured in BTUs. Basically, it looks at dryness of the conditions um, and the, the heat, temperature, moisture. It does not consider wind conditions. So it's a good indicator of long-term um, drought type conditions. But what we basically saw at all three stations over time, uh, going back to 65 to uh, 2008, again, 20 years after the 88 fires, an increase in those ERCs over time. And I'd like to look at that at a couple locations throughout Utah here. So the first fire I want to look at is a choke cherry fire. It was the type 3 IC on this fire. This is actually on the Utah, or Utah, Nevada border. You actually had to go into Wendover, Nevada, and back out into Utah to get to the fire. Fire was about 1,700 acres in size, almost 1,800 acres in size. This green line here, it was in a WSA. So one of the things from a management standpoint um, we were provided with was they wanted us to manage the fire when it came out on the flats but they really didn't want us getting into the upper elevations, again, because of the WSA wilderness study area characteristics, and also for a safety standpoint. You know, they didn't want us putting firefighters on these rocks, having them fall off, get injured, and that sort of thing. But there was a concern. Elevation, the lower um, reaches of this fire was, was about 5,800 feet, and concern as far as if it got out into the flats, the potential for cheatgrass invasion. So we, we, we tried managing it in that format. Um, we were able to hang on to it for seven days. Uh, we actually left it with still heat on the ground, which is kind of unusual, especially for the BLM and the West Desert District. But they were very comfortable with that. And, and the fire basically went out on its own. Did a lot of good. This is that transition that was just talked about before, uh, where we've lost, a lot of the, um, we've lost a lot of the sagebrush in this area um, because of the invasion of uh, Pinion juniper. So a lot of our treatments that we're doing in a mechanical standpoint try to mimic this sort of thing <coughs> on the landscape. And if we look at the choke cherry fire and those ERCs, this, this station was Vernon. I can only go back to 91 on this one. But uh, 
you know, do see an increase in those ERCs, not to the degree we saw on some of those Yellowstone examples, but uh, I'm seeing an increase. The blue line is the yearly measurement, or the measurement of the July average ERC. Uh, red line is the five-year average, and the green line is the 10-year average. Next fire, I spent actually three tours on Box Canyon fire doing about every function that I could there, it seemed like. But uh, this was about, it was uh, 4,724 acres in size. Uh, this is outside of Oakley, just to the uh, southeast of the, here. This was kind of an unusual fire. This was human caused. It was in an area being considered for its wilderness values. Um, but they decided, not necessarily because of the resource values, but because of the location. It was about an hour to hike into from, from uh, Smith and Morehouse Reservoir to the fire itself, which was about an hour hike in. A lot of dead and down material in there, steep terrain. They decided that the only thing they're going to really do is keep it from coming out towards Smith and Morehouse. What it did on its own and within the perimeter, um, the uh, Forest Service was good with. So we managed it as such. And... Uh, uh, it was, I, like I said, I, I spent the better part of my year or summer there. Um, one of the things going on here from a climate change perspective was there was a significant amount of bug kill. Um, most recently in the last three years, the dug fir was hit with uh, spruce budworm. And then 15 to, 10 to 15 years ago, the lodgepole pine was hit with uh, um, mountain pine beetle. So we had a dead and down component, and then we had snags with uh, red needles on a lot of them. This provided for um, the, the uh, heat from the uh, snags would go up, throw sparks or embers in front of it, spot, uh, land on that dead and down lodgepole pine. So this area that um, I could not find any really good fire history in here other than single trees um, was almost a 5,000 acre fire. So if we look at the Camas Ranger District historically back to 1980, um, this looks at the size class of fires they had, the majority of their fires have been in the A and B size class. So that's uh, A fire size is a quarter acre in size, B is up to 10 acres in size. But you can see very few fires in the uh, larger size class. Only one that was 2,000 acres in size had been in this area. So this is the largest fire. And in fact, it was more than the, the total size of all the fires during that time period. Why did that fire get as large as it did? Um, again, a lot of it was that bug kill situation, and part of the reason for the bug kill was because we're not having cold winters, so those larvae survive into the spring, and then we have the bug kill situation. Also, the snowpack was down. In this case, when we look at the ERCs, we see a fairly significant uh, slope, and uh, uh, that, that is of concern. Um, again, this fire, you know, other than trying to keep it from coming out to Smith and Morehouse, uh, no action was taken on it, and it was managed over the long term for about, uh, actually, it still hasn't been considered contained and called out. The last fire I want to visit is actually a prescribed burn. This is over in Vernal in the Book Cliffs, and uh, this is the Tom Patterson prescribed fire. We've been planning this fire for almost eight years, you know, going through the NEPA document, cultural clearances, and that sort of thing. But from a, culture, or from a climate change standpoint, one of the problems is, the, the prescription wants to, it, the desire is to burn this in the fall, in September. Well, what's been happening the last two, few years in September? We can't get resources because fire seasons have been extended longer into the year. So September, they're still out on fires in northern Idaho, and we can't get a helicopter to do the burn and that sort of thing. Another concern on this burn was uh, cheatgrass. This burn, the lower elevation, I believe it's at 6,500 feet, up to almost 8,000 8, feet. We're starting to get cheatgrass in that 6,500 feet level. That's one thing we used to not have out in Vernal. And uh, so we were avoiding some of those areas because we don't want that to uh, go into where we burned. ERCs, this is actually the exact same slope that we saw with the, uh, the previous uh, wildfire. So again, a concern as far as those ERCs are increasing um, over the uh, time span from the uh, raw station. Um, Marshall Draw was a prescribed burn we did about 10 years ago, 2007 I guess actually. 
um, so almost set 10 years ago. Uh, it was kind of like the poster child. I, I thought it was a great burn. Everything went excellent. Went back there a couple years afterwards. The hy hydrological cycle's going. The watershed's doing great. We're seeing water in streams that we hadn't seen before. Um, there's new uh, springs popping up. Um, went back there a couple years ago, and we've got cheatgrass. Again, this is at 7,000 foot. And uh, so one of the things we're looking at from a management standpoint is, is prescribed fire a viable option for us? Unless we have, because it's actually promoting us to have to do additional management on it because of the cheatgrass. So I like this kind of statement, and I think it was mentioned a couple times, as far as the fire regime cautioned by Jim Agee, uh, the natural fire regimes of the past are not the regimes of the present, nor will they be the regimes of the future, and, and we need to look at that from a management standpoint. So with that, I want to look at addressing climate change in a couple other ways. So from a Bureau standpoint, we do have an executive order from the President to consider climate change in our management actions. The CEQ further has uh, our requirements in our NEPA reviews for climate change. Lastly, um, our um, record of decisions and resource management plans have to consider climate change. As far as from a suppression standpoint and response, um, you know, I mentioned on that Tom Patterson burn, we we're having issues getting, being able to implement it because resources aren't available. We're now seeing our fire season go from 1980, when it was at 200 days per year, to we're almost at 300 days a year in the west of having a fire season. You know, that's starting in the southwest, going all the way to California. So, I mean, we're sending resources today. We've got resources down in Cedar City in Utah on a wildfire. Um, last week, we were sending resources to Reno, Nevada for a wildfire. You know, typically this time of year, we've laid off most of our resources because there's not the funding to, to cover it. We're also seeing, at least on the Forest Service side, more so than interior, but in 1995, 16% of their budget went towards fire. In 2015, 52% of it went towards fire. And in 2025, it's projected that 67% of that's going towards fire. Again, you have a longer season, you have to keep resources on longer, or convert seasonals to permanents. Um, just the cost as far as keeping aviation assets on and that sort of thing, um, costing us a lot. We're also seeing a lot more mega fires. Mega fires, I mean, technically, it's supposed to be any fire over 100,000 acres. You know, we used to think of a, a large fire being a thousand acres in size. Now we're looking at 100,000. This is actually my first mega fire. It was the Biscuit Fire, and it was 250 acres shy of being half a million acres. So those fires are, are um, impacting us, and that's also what's also driving up our cost. That that two percent of fires is what really costs us a lot. And uh, you know, a good thing on mega fires, if you're interested, is 60 Minutes had a special a couple years ago that I recommend looking at. Another thing that's costing us is our ESNR. This was the West Government Creek Fire from this summer. That, um, um, it actually burnt into fuels treatments. We like to think of those fuels treatments as being resilient and not having to do any action. This is down in the uh, about 5,800 feet level. And again, we're gonna have to seed that in an ESNR action just because of our concern. One, it is critical sage grouse habitat and it's a sage grouse population in the sheep rocks that is on the verge of, um, um, of collapse, basically. And uh, so there's concern for that, plus we don't want to get cheatgrass in there. Um, one of the things that we've done as far as adjusting, I've, I've, we, we used to do quite a bit of burning when I first actually got here in Utah 12 years ago. About 50% of our treatments were prescribed burning. Um, we're down to um, doing, uh, two years ago, we were down to 2% of our burning was prescribed burning. Last, this last fiscal year, fiscal year, should actually say 16, was 4% of our treatments are burning. Again, that threat of cheatgrass coming in, along with air quality issues and stuff like that, has made us change our, our direction. With that, though, we're continuing to, uh, um, you know, move forward. We've actually uh, invested over $143 million in fuels treatment since the National Fire Plan, which came to be in, in 2000. Um, within Utah, we've treated over 837,000 acres um, within the state. We're starting to see an impact. 216 of those treatments actually have been impacted by wildfire. So either a wildfire has started in a treatment and they've been able to access that treatment, keep it to you know, the one tree juniper type thing, or the fire's burnt up to that treatment. We're also seeing where um, 
cumulatively, you know, with that 837,000 acres treated, we're actually doing more treatments than we are having wildfires occur. You know, we had a little bust in 2005, 6, and 7 that uh, we actually had more acres burned, which is the red line. The green is the cumulative fuels treatments, and the blue lines are what we're doing each year. We're almost reaching 100,000 acres a year of fuels treatments, but we're feeling that, you know, perhaps those treatments are having a positive impact in, in reducing the numbers of acres burned within Utah. So again, 837,000 acres treated. Uh, during that time on BLM lands, we had 1.1 uh, million acres treated, or acres burnt. So um, Norm Christensen um, at a conference attended a number of years ago. Within fire, we have what are called the 10 fire orders. And he kind of went through and made up his own 10 fire orders. But I liked his last fire order, and that was that you only think you know what you're doing, be humble, manage adaptively. So with that, um, I thank you. Um, I, I hope one thing as far as you see, fire is a disturbance, is a natural part of our wildland ecosystems. Um, but with climate change, we're seeing uh, increased extent and type of fires on the landscape, but we're continuing with restoration efforts. And uh, with those efforts, we're hoping to develop more resilient environment out there and, and help in our response and protecting values at risk. So any questions before you hit the road and get out of here? Uh, yes? Uh, maybe I didn't hear you clearly, but uh, I think it was the Oakley fire where there was some spruce kill. I think you, you attributed that, or maybe you attributed it generally to climate change. Do you have some specific evidence on that, or were you making a general statement? Just a general statement as far as um, with winters not being as cold as they once were, the larvae are able to survive through the winter. So we are seeing some increase in, in uh, the bug kill, the level of bug kill, because um, they're able to survive through the winter. Okay, but at that specific location, the bug kill may have had nothing to do with climate change. It may have just been an endemic event. It, 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 that is that possibility. Okay. Anything else? Yes, in the way back. Um, I don't know about the eight, that specific age class. I think maybe more so what's contrib contributing to that, though, is you know you do have those older trees. You do have fuels that have been coming up in the understory. So you know historically, you would have gotten low-intensity surface fires coming through like a ponderosa pine stand, for example. Now we've got white fir or other species in the understory. So rather than being a surface fire, it's becoming a, a crown fire, which is enlarging the fire. But I don't think necessarily that the, the age of of you know that 1910 before necessarily would be impacting it. Yeah. Ma'am in the white vest. Well, I was just wondering if the treat, does the treatment, what do the treatments involve when you do the treatment? Is it just the treatment itself, or is it something about any seeding? Are you talking about any seeding programs? I was wondering, kosher, for example, kosher clustering. We, we do a lot, you know, it varies from site to site whether or not seeding is an element, and a lot of our work we do is in partnership with the Utah Partnership for Conservation and Development and the Watershed Restoration Initiative. And through them, we, a lot of times, if we feel that there's a threat for cheatgrass or if we don't feel that there's an adequate seed bank on the site, we will work with them where, with, for seeding those. So um, a lot of our treatments, especially in that pin, ponderosa or the pinyon juniper, um, where we're trying to reduce the encroachment down to the sagebrush, will include se seeding. and. Uh, Forge, forge coaches sometimes that, especially if there's a high risk of, um, of uh, cheatgrass invasion, just putting something on there to, to outcompete the cheatgrass. Or maybe along roadsides, you know, ESNR type projects, we might do forge kosher just again to outcompete the cheatgrass. Well, I, I wanted to bring it up because I know in Idaho they're having such a problem with forage kosher being a natural
I don't think we're having as much a problem that they are in Idaho as far as it being an invasive species we're able to. At least, you know, they've been, we've been using forage kosher at least for the last 10 years and I haven't, you know, the, the one thing that forage kosher has going for it is it stays, it, it's the live fuel moisture of forage kosher stays in place a lot longer than cheatgrass so it does help us out with, uh, you know, the wildfire when we get unintended events. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, 